Caradina shrimp are the most stunning freshwater species that you can keep, but they're also the most sensitive. If you're struggling to keep them alive and thriving in your aquarium, then this video is for you. We're gonna go through and talk about the proper tank setup, the right parameters, and the common mistakes beginners make when keeping these species in their aquarium. Let's jump on in to number one, your tank setup. What are the essentials that you need? We're not going to advance right now, so we're just gonna keep it very simple. You do not want smaller than five gallons because you're gonna have large fluctuations in water when you have um, evaporation. So definitely keep higher than five gallons. These are the smallest tanks I have now for my Caradina shrimp, which are 7.7 .7 gallon cubes. These are two different takes of traditional breeding tanks and what I prefer, lovely scape tanks for my Caradina shrimp. And they have a sponge filter on the traditional one and a hang on back. Shrimp love, if you wanna see them more often, gentler flow. So this top one is only bringing flow to the top of the aquarium. Of course, with your sponge filter, it's just bubble aeration, not always a lot of flow. So highly recommend lower flow, especially if you wanna go through and breach your shrimp. And you also wanna go through and make sure you have a lid, helps with evaporation, not a large fluctuation of evaporation and water parameters of consistent um, minerals being in there. So you just do a lid. It makes your life a lot easier. Also with this small room, keeps humidity down. But that's number one, your tank essentials. S bigger is always better for the size of your tank. Nothing lower than five gallons. Sponge filter or hang on back filter work equally as well. And also, depending on where you live, I live in Arizona, you may need a heater for those winter months because you want to keep a consistent temperature, not large fluctuations in your temperature, especially for your higher end Caradina shrimp, which I have in this tank, orange eyes. In this tank, we have some crystals. Well, kind of fancy tires this is what I'm breeding them into. But anyways, let's go through and talk about number two. Number two is going to be substrate and hardscape. Now, two different takes on this aquarium here. Boom and boom. That's like the Spock. <laughs> um, we have Oh, in this one, contro soil, so something like ADA Amazonia, um, fluval stratton, some type of beaded substrate that help buffer the pH, making it more acidic is ideal. You also want something that's going to get a ton of surface area that adds to the aquarium for biofilm. Shrimps love grazing on biofilm. They even love these hanging rooted plants in this aquarium where they're just flourishing. So the more surface area you can provide in your aquarium for biofilm to build up for them to graze on is ideal. Buffering substrate is also ideal as well because it's gonna lower that pH. Wood is another great example of that as well because after it starts releasing tannins, it's making a more acidic environment. Again, two takes on this one, two takes on these tanks. We have um, volcanic stone with no wood. We have contra soil and we have green walls on left and right side. This one is more of a traditional scape, which I would do. And this is wood. We have some contra soil and we have some rock as well. Now, both of these rocks, volcanic and also this one, which is the, it starts with an H, I forget the name of it. They're inert hardscape. So your hardscape, your rock and your stone, you wanna make sure it's inert, not leaching minerals into your water column making the TDS higher and raising that pH. So that's also key as well. So that's going through and understanding your hardscape and your substrate. All right, so let's talk about one of the key parts. It's your make or break when keeping Caradina shrimp. And that is number three, water parameters. Now you wanna make sure that you're keeping the most stable water parameters in your aquarium. And the only way to do that is using RODI water. So if you can only get tap water, Caradina shrimp, unfortunately, aren't for you. I'm preventing you from spending a ton of money on these shrimp and losing out. But if you can get RODI water, you need to remineralize it because you're not just using RODI water. You're going to remineralize it with some type of remineralizer. I use bee shrimp from Salty Shrimp, and that sounds kind of addy. This isn't an ad. <laughs> this is bee shrimp from Salty Shrimp and I add this into my gallon jugs before I add it into my aquariums. I mix it up, 
very easy to measure. Highly recommend that. Reason being is that your Caradina shrimp require a pH of 5.8 to 6.5. Steady in that range, not fluctuating highly and unanticipated, which happens when you're not using RODI water. Also, you want to be aware of what you're adding in there as we go back up to number two, right? Wood, the substrate, is it going to buffer it down at any point? So very key when you're keeping your shrimp that you're tuned in to using RODI water, remineralizing. Caradina shrimp only have a GH, no KH. There's a caveat. Someone's probably going to comment. I've kept them in one of my other tanks over here that was for Neo Caradina and it has KH. Did they breed? No. Were they the cheapest type of Caradina shrimp? The crystals? They were. That being said, I love seeing my Caradina shrimp flourish and breed. So no KH. If you want to have successful shrimp, no KH. Now let's talk about TDS. TDS typically when I'm remineralizing it and using it sits at about 115 when I'm using the correct measurements from the B salty shrimp um, remineralizer. My pH for both of these tanks actually sit at about 5.9, 5.8 is where they're sitting at. They never go any higher, they never go any lower, even when I'm doing 10% water changes as well. We'll talk about water changes here in a little bit, but being aware of that. So I highly recommend getting some type of tester and you're probably like, hey Mike, how do you know where your tanks sit? I have one of these easy TDS checkers and pH checkers for my aquarium that I test the water before it goes in, any water changes, and then I also test where it's at just because it's fun. When you're first starting out setting up a tank, highly recommend it. You'll learn what works and where it sits after a while, um, but highly recommend picking up some tester. You can get one that just tests the TDS, but you will be wanting to chase your TDS when you're remineralizing in caradina keeping so that is tip number three and what's your make or break all right now let's move on to number four we're going to go through and talk about feeding and biofilm one of the most essential ways of getting nutrients to your caradina shrimp so first and foremost you're going to want to make sure you're feeding them a high grade quality shrimp food two to three times per week i've been testing out this new one from Plamski, I think it's called. My shrimps have been loving these. I tried a bunch of different ones. I've just been getting stuff that's at my local aquarium store versus ordering online. But my Caradina shrimp love the three different types that I get them and I switch them up every single week. I don't know if you can pick these up online, but basically I have protein bites so they get protein, which definitely helps with breeding. I have some rise here as well. This is just Typically what I go through and feed them for um, molting correctly because it has a high calcium content in it. And then also going through and making sure that I'm feeding them with this Fury one, which is kind of like my go-to anytime they just need a typical feeding and I'm not trying to get them additional nutrients into them. Just be aware when you're feeding them, you get ammonia spikes from that food. So it's ideal when keeping Caradina shrimps to do at least a 10% water changes when you're going through and keeping them because you're feeding them more actively pellets, right? And if there's any leftover food, typically I wait six or eight hours, I remove it. The next one is gonna be making sure whenever you do a water change, you're adding some more food to make biofilm. And the key part of doing that, my little hidden secret gem is Bacter AE. So whenever I do a water change, don't do a full scoop. Let me show you this thing. Man, if you went through and did a full scoop, you'll be out of luck here. Um, that's way too much activated nutrients to feed biofilm. I'm scooping this so you're like, Michael, why are you looking down? Don't worry, I'm gonna show you. This is as much as I go through and scoop. How do I flip this around? Can you see that? There's like a little, oh, there's the camera. I guess I won't focus unless it's over here. This is like a tip of a, um, what do you call those? Like a toothpick. Toothpick and worth of added nutrients to these smaller tanks to make sure I'm feeding that um, macronutrients to create and feed biofilm. Um, as you can see this wall here, I've been keeping green walls on my non-show tanks um, to help feed additional biofilm um, to my shrimp as well. 
So again, feeding regiments two to three times, pellets of some sort, and then making sure you're having active biofilm for when you're not feeding for them to graze off of as well. Your shrimp are happy when they are actively always grazing and feeding, as you can see my OEs going over here and grazing on the sidewalls. Um, they should always be actively feeding. That's gonna bring us right over to the common beginner mistakes that people make. And number one is gonna be using tap water. Don't do it. There is GH and KH in a high TDS in most tap waters. I live in Arizona, that's a matter of fact. Also, your treatment plants for your water local municipality changes from a month to month basis on how they process their water. That is unstable, uncontrollable. You can't prevent what's happening from there. So what you need to do is do RODI water, which strips all of that out of the water, and then you remineralize uptake that water and add it into your aquarium. Next one is over cleaning your filters. Now these filters, you have your hang on back, which has a pre-filter recommended. That's like one of the highest tips because there's going to be baby shrimp. So it's going to be sucked up. Um, and then all of your sponge filters, of course, they have a sponge on top of it. <laughs> Whenever you're going through and cleaning them because of flow issues, that's the only time I go through and clean them. You're over cleaning them. You're rinsing them in tap water. It's killing everything that's on them from a biofilm perspective and then adding that same tap water, which has a bunch of chemicals back into those aquariums. Don't do that. Do about a 10% water change into some type of cup. With that sponge itself, you're gonna pinch it. Do I have a sponge laying around here? I guess I do, this is a smaller one. This is a bit very dirty. But basically when you have your sponge, you're just going like this in and out to get rid of all of the broken up matter from waste, from plants and releasing it out so there can get more filtration, meaning flow through that sponge filter. So don't over clean your filters. Next one is gonna be drastic water changes. I did this a lot because I added my shrimp too early and maintaining my aquariums as they were getting flourishing because they're more planted. Don't do that, right? Whenever you are ready to add your uh, shrimp into your aquarium, it should have been cycled. It should be about six to eight weeks later on. I've done it in four weeks now because I'm more experienced, but for you all, six to eight weeks, let it cycle, let all of your uh, plant matter and all of that stuff get into its perfect routine where you're not having to do large water uh, changes to help the cycle of the tank. When you're there, do not do large water changes. You should only be doing about 10% of the water. That's weird. How do I, oh, that way like that, <laughs> there we go. 10% from here to here is about 10% to 15% of the water should be removed. I do it on a weekly basis, believe it or not, especially for these breeding tanks and they're doing amazing. Now, when your tanks are older, like four to six months, you don't have to do as much. I have it in my volcanic scape over here. This one over here, I do this one about every four weeks, if that, and these things are flourishing as well. When I feed them, you'll see them out there. You'll see a clip come up at some point of how amazing these guys are doing. Um, but this one, not as much. That one's just a well-cycled tank. So you don't have to, I don't have to maintain it as much as um, my other two, which are brand new. Brand new being like three months old. So smaller water changes. The next one's gonna be adding too many shrimp. So you don't wanna overburden the tank to start out with, because you're gonna be feeding more than you need to, and it's gonna cause a huge ammonia spike. You want the colony to build up itself. So I recommend typically around 15 shrimp to start, right? Whatever is within your budget, I wouldn't go less than six because you're gonna probably have one or two not make it. And you wanna make sure you have a breeding colony size. We'll talk about breeding in our next video. So make sure you go through and check that out when it comes out. But be aware that you don't wanna overcompensate by getting like 30 to 40 fish, which is gonna, I mean shrimp, um, which is gonna be expensive anyways. Next up is going to be your weekly maintenance routine. So I've kind of hammered this home, but remember re-adding or depleting some of your water about 10 to 15 percent. Um, about every other week, I'm not adding remineralized water when I do my water change. I'm doing 10 percent reduction every other week with just RODI water re-added. Slow drip, keyword, slow drip that water back in. Don't frantically refill it right away.
Next one is gonna be going through and vacuuming your substrate. I never vacuum any of my substrates in, turn of, in terms of pulling the substrate up and vacuuming anything underneath it, no. What I do is I skim the top of it and anything that decides to come up as it's passing by will be vacuumed up. So don't disturb that substrate. It's gonna create a big ammonia spike and definitely damage those sensitive shrimp. Next one is gonna be monitoring those molting issues. So if you just did a water change and you see a ton of new molts the next day, I'm talking about more than one, then you did something wrong with that water being re-added or it was too much. So avoid that and check for molting issues whenever you do a brand new water change. Caridina shrimp success comes down to keeping a well-balanced and safe environment which will then reward you with beautiful colored caradina shrimp and hopefully babies. And if you're looking to actually see how to successfully breed your caradina shrimp, check out my step-by-step -step guide right here where I detail how you can be a successful shrimp keeper that breeds caradina shrimp in my next video. And also, if you found this helpful, please take the time to like, and if you have any successes yourself, comment below as well. But until next time, I'll see you all on the next shrimp keeping video.